Hi. Hey, Giovanna, how are you? Good, how are you? Finally, get to meet you after all this time. Sure, no problem. How are you? My background in audio okay? Yeah, you sound good. I like that when you tilted it down a little bit, that was better. Just like yeah, a little bit. Okay. okay, yeah, a little better. Um, I'm just trying to figure this out. I've been doing these on a different platform, but just going back to good old Zoom um, mm -hmm. because we've been having some issues. Zoom seems to be best, so I'm just... Okay. The thing is, here, I'm going to change my name. Um, normally, we can have um, a captioning. We have a captioning program. Mm -hmm. uh, autom does automatic captioning, but I can't do that and have it linked directly to Facebook. So I'm just going right. to turn that off. That's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> You're always something. It is always something. Anyway, uh, where are you? Where I'm are in you Windsor, Connecticut. Oh, I grew up in Connecticut. Did you really? Where? Westport. Oh, okay. That's downstate. But yes, I know where it is. I have been there. So yeah. did you say Windsor? Yeah, Windsor. It's uh, just outside of Hartford. Oh, okay. North, northwest of northeast of Hartford. Northeast of Hartford. All right. Mm -hmm. And how is it there today? How's your weather? Oh, it's beautiful. I went out for a walk today. I, th I thought, you know, a couple of days ago we were in winter coats. So I thought that was going to be it. And then um, today, 69, 70 degrees. And oh. it's going to be 70 degrees tomorrow, too. So right now, <laughs> who knows but it's new england you know that's what happens with our weather right it just changes huh changes yeah. all the time. where are you where are you now i'm in uh, santa barbara california oh okay yep um and also the weather i mean the weather here is pretty amazing but it's gonna get colder it's supposed to rain which we haven't we don't have rain for like from April through November, there's no mm -hmm. rain. So this is the first rain is gonna be this weekend. I'm pretty excited. Wow. Yeah. yeah, we could use some rain too. Cause I, I, I live in a renovated factory that's right next to the river. So there's two miles of river trails right outside um, my door. And uh, walking uh -huh. by, I could see the river was like really, really, really low. So wow. we could use some rain. Well, you'll get some snow eventually. Right? Yeah. So you yep. get a lot, probably a lot of snow. Hopefully. Last winter we did not get a lot. So we'll see what happens. Oh, really? Huh. I wonder if the weather is the same up there as in, down in Westport. I think we had it pretty mild on the yeah. near the water. It's and it's colder similar. up where you are. Yeah, it's pretty similar. Because Connecticut, if you remember, is not really a big state. So. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. Nowadays, California is like, Probably could fit 10 Connecticut's. Mm -hmm. yeah. Easily. Were you anywhere near the fires? I mean, the smoke came down here. Mm -hmm. I wasn't near the fires, recent, the recent ones, but we had smoke for sure, which was really, um, you know, the smoke is really disturbing because it just yeah. hangs in the air and you can't, you shouldn't really go out and it gets real bad. Yeah. Um, but then about two years ago, we had a really bad fire here. Mm -hmm. um, and there were mudslides. I don't know if you remember that. Oh, right, right. In Montecito, yeah, and like 20 people died, mm -hmm. which is part of, Montecito is kind of part of Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. um, that was horrible. So, yeah. yeah, but we we were okay this year, although it still goes, the fire season continues now through December. Oh, wow. Because, because there's less rain and there's kind of still a, we're, we're not really in drought, but it, mm -hmm. it can be um oh that's right I, rem I remember hearing stories about california and the concern about w drought and water so that's why you're so excited you're getting rain yeah it's awesome you know and it i mean the drought is officially over we had good rain the last three years which was oh, amazing in fact i i didn't plant a garden until three years ago because um i've lived at this house for about eight years but i didn't plant a garden because it was a drought and it was just like i just didn't want to use up the water but right now that we have rain, it's been great. I love it. Oh, I mean, yeah. At least we, it's greener here and my garden is doing better. Mm -hmm. So let's see, what should we, let's talk about this. Okay. Um, I think I got it worked out. I'm just making right. sure. I, um, so what we'll do is 
this will be live streamed to Facebook. So <clears throat> inside of the accessible yoga community, mm -hmm. um, people can comment there. So they won't comment directly on here and chat or anything, but up, mm -hmm. up in there in the, in the unaccessible yoga. So I'll follow along, um, see if people have questions or anything like that. Um, and um, usually I'd like to start with some kind of centering. Would you mind leading when we start? Some kind no of problem. Yeah, I, I watched the uh, interview you did with Gail Parker and I figured you were gonna ask me that, so I'm- oh, Okay, <laughs> oh my gosh, and the sound with Gail, it was horrible. That's why I changed, you know? Oh, just, okay. That was just so, she's incredible. Well, you are too, but she's incredible. Yeah. And I was so excited to talk to her and I was so frustrated with myself that yeah. there was that, what was it, echoing or something? I don't know, it was just so bad. Oh my gosh, so. I just gave up on that. That mm -hmm. we used something else called Crowdcast, and okay. it just didn't work. So, well, good uh, for you for mastering all the technical stuff. Or not? I mean, just keep moving <laughs> on. This <laughs> this one it sounds good. We won't have any feedback, any okay. of that. So, I mean, thank goodness. All right. Um, but yeah, that would be great. And then otherwise, we just talk. So I don't, you know, I I mostly plan to ask you about your book. Okay. Um, I haven't read it, so I'm, I feel really bad. I have I have skimmed it though. Okay. Um, because I wanted to get a sense of it for today. It looks amazing. Right. Um, and I thought we could just talk about that. I mean, I'm part of why I haven't read it is I'm I'm trying to finish my book. Oh. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a it's a trip. It's a trip. Uh, yeah, I only have a month left for my mm -hmm. deadline, and uh, so much work to do. Mm -hmm. um, it's just so hard to find time for reading when I'm writing. I just yeah all my time. How long did it take? Well, you know, I'm not going to ask you now. I'm going to ask you then. Right. I'm going to ask you. But I wonder if there's anything in particular you want to me to ask you about or not talk about or anything like. No, I mean, um, if you want to sort of segue into the post that you put up on Yoga for Healthy Aging, I thought that was like super, super wonderful. And oh. I left a comment that said, this should be required reading for every single <laughs> yoga training program there is out there yeah oh thank you yeah. so just yeah, the whole blog, you know, that recent well, blog I wrote you mean yeah yeah like what are we doing with yoga is it you know the, the purpose yeah. to get you to stand on your head no <laughs> uh, okay well we'll have lots of fun then because I could talk about that forever all right cool I mean if, if you're excited about that too yeah let's okay. talk about it and and for some people and well, I should, well, I'll just say for some people, it's a long trip. I mean, I've been doing yoga for 50 years, teaching since 95-ish. So, wow. you know, you get to a point where you realize, oh, wait a minute. I know people told me that yoga was more than asana, but uh -huh. whoa. <laughs> I started teaching in 95 also. Oh, did you? Cool. Yeah, we're like the same. Yeah. But you've been practicing a lot longer, it sounds like. Wow. Yeah, it years. was either that or uh, see a shrink and get Valium because it was just after the birth of my son. And it was oh, like, wow. oh my God, if I don't find something, I'm going crazy. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel the same way with my kids. Yeah. How many do you have? I have one son and okay. a one stepson. Okay. Wow. That's awesome. Are they grown? How old? Oh, yeah. They're all they're grown and born. Gone. Yeah. But they keep in my son keeps in touch. My stepson, not so much, um, but my son keeps in touch and uh, he doesn't live too far away. So he shows up and he's supposed to Thanksgiving, Christmas and, and texts. <laughs> and um, he's an artist. So uh -huh. a couple of the posts I did encouraging people to go out to vote. I had him do one with um, uh -huh. three heroes, um, Captain America, Zorro, and Black Oh yeah, Panther. I saw that. Oh, you did? Yeah, those. My, yeah, my son oh. did those for me. Oh, he did those. So he's it's like a he's like a cartoonist. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and he, he plays in a band, and then he does a weird, um, weird uh, illustration kind of stuff for the underground bands. We ever heard of Hot Rod Surf? No. Yeah, see, not too many people have it. <laughs> I don't know how he got into it, but um, he plays drums in a hot rod surf band and, and the, all the bands in this underground community put out their music and he does a lot of their CD covers and stuff or MP3 covers or whatever they are, so. Okay. But, yeah, yeah. Well, that's cool. That's pretty cool. That's awesome. You've got two kids. I do, they're um, 19 and 15. 
Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> you're home and you've got a ways to go. Yeah, it's a lot, but mm -hmm. you're doing good right now. Good. Um, so, um, all right, well, that sounds good. I'm just gonna just start with the centering and I'll ask you questions. Okay. And, um, you know, let's see, I just, do you have any questions for me about it? About um, no, just wondering if you were still, you know, going to be able to do an endorsement for my book, even though you've got your own stuff going yes, on. Yes, is it too late? Is it too um, late? Well, I probably in, in about like three weeks or so, because I'm we're in the editing and design stage okay. right now. All right. I think, I, I mean, I'm going to have to skim, though. I hope that that's, that's okay. okay. I can skim. That's okay. And then okay. Because yeah. <laughs> it's funny, I get people ask me, and it's like, I really want to read the whole book, you know, but I just... Mm -hmm. I'm like, don't, I, definitely, I can do something that if I can Probably. just And it's that. unedited, so if you come across like a typo and a mistake, you say, well, that doesn't make sense. That'll all be fixed because we've been editing right. hours right. on Zoom. Right, I know. How is that? I like it. I, I, I went with a hybrid publisher and I really like them. And um, she's- What does that so mean? Like uh, that's hybrid between self-publishing and- Exactly, because uh -huh. I've self-published one book and I did not want to do that again. It's too hard. So I went hybrid. I had a traditional publisher give me a bite, but I did not really care for what my book would be next to in terms of their, it was a lot of tarot cards and magic and astrology. And oh, right. yeah, this, it didn't fit. So I went hybrid and I'm happy so far. Okay. Well, if you want um, to write another book, I can introduce you to my publisher. Oh, yes, because I've sketched. You are a writer. Oh, yeah. Oh, I yeah. know you're a writer. Huh? I know you're quite a writer. Yeah, thank you. Like to write. It keeps um, me sane right now. Right now, that's the only thing that plus my practice is what keeps me sane. Well, it's funny. My, my editor's name is Beth, so it'll be Beth. Oh, Beth. okay. Um, she's awesome at Shambhala. Oh, Shambhala yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she's. She's always looking for new yoga books. So I would think she'd be a great person for you to talk to. And, and you can just get, you know, she'll just give you a sense of what they're looking for. And you can even tell okay. her what your idea is. Sure. All right. She's amazing. So. Okay. Well, I'm kind of quirky. So she, but I'll, we'll talk about it. I can. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've got a couple ideas. So we'll yeah, see. I don't know. She'll tell you. She'll be honest. Okay. With you. That would and be you're pretty nice. traditional. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? They're pretty traditional. Oh, yes. They're like, you know, they're like, they're trying to come, they're trying to be a little more political, a little mm -hmm. more like progressive, because right now they're kind of seen as like kind of a, a little more stale. Like they, sure. they've done, you know, you know, Shambhala, like a lot of Buddhism and then mm -hmm. like very traditional yoga stuff. So they're really trying to move into more progressive. And so okay. I've been trying to give her names. So yeah. she's interested. Um, cool. Yes. All right. So I'm going to just pause for a moment. I'm just going to go mm -hmm. and see if I can connect with Facebook. Okay, I think we're live, Beth. Okay. All right, thank you so much for joining me. Um, I just wanna say hi to everybody. And um, we're using Zoom, hopefully it's working. I think it is. Uh, whoever's joining us can um, post questions or comments here and I'll try to keep up with them. Uh, and I wanna welcome Beth Gibbs to join me. Welcome, thank, thank you for you. being here, Beth. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I asked you earlier if you wouldn't mind leading some kind of a centering. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'll do that. 
Okay, sure. So if um, everyone wants to take a comfortable position, your eyes can be closed, or if you'd like to keep them open, just allow your gaze to be directed towards the ground and have your spine comfortably aligned. And we're gonna take a little journey through the five layers of self-awareness, beginning with the body. So bring your awareness, begin to explore your toes, the bottoms of your feet, your ankles, your lower legs, just kind of looking for any sensation, any information that your body cares to send. <clears throat> and then let your awareness move over your knees to your thighs, sensing the whole of your right leg, the whole of your left leg, and sensing the pelvis, the belly, the low back, just noticing anything that presents itself with compassion, without judgment. Noticing the rib cage, your abdomen, and the mid back, chest and upper back, and then allowing yourself to tune in to all the body systems, organs, and tissues between the front and back of the torso. Just sensing, feeling, and gradually letting your awareness move to the tops of the shoulders, to the neck, back of the head, top of the head and allow your awareness to drift through your face, forehead softening the forehead, jaw softening, eyes softening, nose, lips softening, chin and throat, noticing, sensing and feeling. And then let your awareness move over the shoulders and down the arms, through the upper arms, past the elbows, the lower arms into the hands and fingers, sensing the whole of your right arm, the whole of your left arm, your whole body, sensing your whole physical body, noticing whatever presents itself. And then bring your awareness to your breath, just watching the flow of breath in and out of the body, not trying to change a thing, just noticing. Breath in, slight pause, breath out, slight pause before the inhalation, just noticing all four parts of your breath. And also noticing the level of energy that you're feeling right now. Just noticing. And then bringing awareness, just checking out the mind. Just noticing the contents of the mind and the flow of the thoughts whether they crowd in or whether there's one at a time, just noticing the mind and then noticing the part of you that is absolutely able to be aware of the body, the breath, the energy and the mind. And then for the next three to five rounds of breath, just sit, sense, feel, and notice all of your layers of being as you rest. And gradually deepen the breath, focusing on your inhalation as your eyes slowly open if they're closed. And if the body needs a little stretch, give that to yourself, whatever the body would like. And hopefully everyone is feeling calm and centered at this moment. Great, thank you. You're welcome. That's what I needed. <laughs> what we all need this week. <laughs> I know, we need to talk about that. But before we talk about that, I just wanna maybe introduce you a little bit more. Um, I know you from, um, well, I think from Nina and the Yoga for Healthy Aging blog originally and all the work you did there, which was really amazing. And, um, you know, and 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 now I ha actually, I got the chance to look at your book, which I'm very excited about talking about with you today. Uh, but I know you've been teaching for a very long time. Can you tell us some more about that? Just about sure. Your um, when I, I have been doing yoga since my son was born and he's over 50 now. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> and I was looking for something to 
to, to sort of formalize the, because I really, really, really enjoyed it when I was just doing it on my own by myself. And I started, I don't know if you ever heard of Richard Hittleman, oh, yeah. but yeah, I found his book in the, first in the library and then in the bookstore. And I still have the book and occasionally go back to it over. But that is what really got me started. And way back then in the early 60s, I was kind of uncomfortable about going to classes because I knew I'd be the only black woman there. Uh -huh. So it made me a little uncomfortable, which is why I started with the book. And then I found some tapes. Then um, I was visiting with some friends on Martha's Vineyard and the wife of the couple we were visiting said, hey, while you're here, you want to take a yoga class? And I was like, oh, you do yoga? I was like, oh my God, yes. And that just said, I don't care if I'm the only one in the class. Yeah. This is what I have to do. So that kind of led to looking for a training program. And I kind of cast around a little bit, but I, I have a kind of a rebellious streak and I, I don't like being told, this is the only way you can do this. <laughs> and uh, I also, <laughs> because I was kind of studious, I wanted something that would connect to something. And somehow I got a brochure in the mail from Joseph LePage. I'm not quite sure how I got on his email list, but I read his brochure and it was like, it was like, wow, he's saying that you adapt the yoga to the person or group of people who are in front of you. Mm -hmm. It's not like you have yoga and you were saying, now we will all do this. It's mm -hmm. like sensing the room and understanding the people. And then you've got all these tools in your yoga toolbox. Which ones will you pull out in the moment? Which is a little more frightening than you know planning something and delivering it without making any adjustments. But mm -hmm. I said, fine. So I called his office, he answered the phone and my first question to him was, are you a guru? And he said, no, I'm just me. And uh -huh. I signed up and, you know, the rest is history. I took his, I took his 200 hour training, then the 300 hour training, then the thousand hour training. And I've just been involved with integrative yoga therapy for its whole evolution until it, uh, he sold the license to Kripalu. And I'm still technically on the, um, on the faculty there, but of course they're closed. So it's just going to kind of depend on what happens when things calm down and they can get to open up. But yeah, wow. that's kind of how I got into it. Wow. That's awesome. So did it merge into Kripalu's teacher training or I mean, they had their own before and then he yes. just added? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He did a couple of years ago um, because he had been doing all on his own and um, it, it a couple of years ago, I think he decided he, it, because every time we would take a training with Joseph, he would be introducing something new. So it was never stayed. It was never boring. And um, I sort of found myself on the faculty because for some reason he thought I could do it. <laughs> and when I asked him, why do you think I could teach, teach the, your material? He said, you've been at every lecture I've ever given since like 1992. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, okay. Uh and, and bit the bullet. But um, I think he finally wanted to just do something else. So although he's still planning at this point, as far as I know, um, going back to Kripalu and teaching, a couple of years ago, he decided to sell the license for integrative okay. yoga therapy to Kripalu. So now it's the Kripalu School of Integrative Yoga Therapy. And we're still kind of involved with that, but they take the lead. Great. All right. And, and how are you doing? I mean, uh, you know, considering what's happening these days today, we're hoping for some news today. Um, yeah. You know, that by oh, how am I doing with the political stuff? Yeah, how are you doing with that? I feel like we need to talk about it for a minute. Cause... Yeah, um, I'm really stressed out. And I was thinking, I feel better today because I can see the way things are going. And I've been telling myself, my parents, and my great aunt who I who lived next door to each other while I was growing up, they lived through the, um, the depression, the, the Spanish flu pandemic and two world wars. Yes. So if the worst happens, 
if I can't live through this, uh -huh. then I've got a serious problem that even <laughs> yoga can't help with. <laughs> help <you> with. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, I, I like that perspective, though, that like to think about what, what our ancestors lived through and yeah. the different struggles they've had. And yeah, it's true. I think maybe we've been just so lucky the last couple decades, like no, you know, I mean, there's been a lot of problems, but generally like no, no local wars here on, on U.S. soil. And anyway, so yeah, although I have to say like, you know, my background's in um, AIDS activism. So I have to say the pandemic just kind of brings that all up for me. You know, it feels okay. like dealing with AIDS again. Mm -hmm. But at least today feels positive. I feel like um, it looks like Biden w is winning and it will be hopefully announced soon. So I just feel very um, relieved. Yeah. And I get emails from my friends. I have two friends, uh, one in Connecticut and one in Portland, who lived just a couple of blocks away from all the unrest that was in Portland oh, right. a, a while ago. And uh, she was having trouble sleeping and had to put in her earplugs. So I was giving her breathing techniques and we were exchanging uh, emails all the time. And I said to them, I said, no matter what happens, I said, I am not going to exhale until January 20th and I see Uncle Joe's hand on the Bible. Then I will exhale. Until then, it's like, oh! Ah! Uh, I know, right? <laughs> so hopefully you'll get little breaths in there. Yes. Uh, but so yeah. I, okay. <laughs> that was a, that was a funny, that was a joke. That was a joke. And I know that about you, by the way. You also huh? do, you do stand-up comedy, don't you? Well, I did do, I've done two or three bits. Okay. Well, actually, no, probably more four or five bits. And it was something that was always on my bucket list. And um, about four years ago, uh, because at the end of Joseph's training, we would always do a talent show. Ah. And one of the other teachers in that particular training program, um, she, she was funny. And so we decided that we would tag team and for the talent show we would do a stand-up routine she'd pick her little bit and I'd pick my little bit and we would just oh. play off each other oh. and I was like great because now I can cross that off my bucket list so I've done that and then the local arts center uh, was looking for some amateurs to do a couple of stand-up pieces so I bit the bullet scared to death um, because you don't have notes and you know when you're doing lectures you've got your notes and you've got your um your your slideshows and stuff and you've got something to hold on to yeah. and that was like terrifying but i did it i did it twice so wow. it's all on hold right now oh and there's also something the local um connecticut public television had this thing that was running for a while called the mouth off and they would select a theme and you would submit um five no more about five to ten minutes of material and if they selected you you could go and perform so i did a mouth off they taped it they right. sent me the tapes so i was able to put that up on my website so okay yeah so yeah i funny comedy and humor is just one way to to really it's a helpful way i think to deal with stress and i so think it's that. nice in yoga actually like i i find myself really telling a lot of jokes <laughs> good oh yeah me too it's great you know, when i'm teaching because it's just it, it just lifts up the energy and it makes it lighter and people, mm -hmm. help people relax um, right. so i just find that is a huge part of what what i do and i thought maybe i should go into comedy i was talking to amber carnes about it too yeah. well no i don't think i'm really but amber also has this idea of wanting to be um actually i think amber might have done some bits uh -huh. of comedy like you so i think there is a theme there could be could be <laughs> absolutely Absolutely. So, okay, I want to hear about your new book, and I think you've already, ri you've already written one book, right? Yeah, I did about uh, 2013, it was published, um, it was called Ogi Bogi, The Elephant Yogi, and yes. that book came about because my full-time job at that time was being executive director of um, uh, Hartford's Camp Current, which is a summer day camp for Hartford kids who live in the city of Hartford that's mm -hmm. been going on since 1894. It wow. is the oldest free day camp for city kids in the nation, right? So <clears throat> I was involved in all of that. And when I got the job, I said, these kids need yoga. So of course I started a yoga program, hired a couple of teachers and we would um, teach the kids ages five to 13. And then the, the junior counselors who were 13 to 15. And so we ran classes for all of them. And 
I was listening to their stories because they are very talkative and we would ask them for evaluations and they would, um, they would share their, because many of them had never done yoga before. And they would say things like, when I'm in yoga class, I feel like I'm one with the universe. Nobody told this kid that. Yeah. And another kid who was coming out of, um, did yoga intervention because just be, if they got in trouble, rather than sending them home, they would go to a yoga teacher for five to 15 <laughs> minutes. And uh, one teacher was teaching this little boy who'd gotten in fights. She taught him a breath technique, very simple. And he said to her afterwards, I didn't know that I had control over how I acted. Um, I know. I mean, it was like mind blowing. So I said, I'm going to write a book. This is a curriculum. Uh -huh. And so the first thing I did was I, I went to uh, several organizations that already um, taught or trained people to teach kids. I had not done a specific children's training. And I said, I would like to borrow your materials. I will pay for them. I will give you full credit. I told them what I was doing. And they all said, no you have to take our training. So I was like, okay, well, then I will write my own and I will use the kids that we've been working with as source for what are their problems, what are their concerns, and how can yoga deal with that? So Ogi Bogi, the elephant yogi came into being and I self-published it. That was a long journey. Okay. And mm -hmm. now you have, tell us about your new book. Sure. Um, this book um, called Enlighten Up the Five Layers of Self-Awareness um, is based on that 3000 year old model, the Kosha model that comes from the Taittiriya Upanishad that I first learned um, with Joseph. And it was so interesting to me because it was, um, he was describing this is a, a way to think or how yoga thinks about how we are as human beings. And I heard him I understood what he was saying, but when I went back home to try to implement it, it, it literally took nine months. Mm. It's the, the same length of time it takes to birth a baby, but it was literally took that long for me to get it in my cells. And once I got it in my cells and I understood what we were talking about and what I was dealing with, then, then I could teach it. So it's been a foundation for every single class or workshop or training I've ever done since, since that particular time. And when I went looking for, I said, there must be a book on this somewhere. And I went looking, I couldn't find one. Eventually, I did find a couple of pamphlets. This is about three years ago. And I found BKS Iyengar's book, Light on Life. Mm -hmm. But both the pamphlets and Iyengar's book is helpful and as rich as they were for me, they were all steeped in Sanskrit and the, and the traditional language of yoga. And I thought, well, if I had had a book that just explained it in plain English with a little bit of humor and some stories, it might not have taken nine months to sort of uh -huh. get it so I could teach it. So I just like, just like Ogie Bogie, I said, well, I guess I'll have to write one. <laughs> Yeah, that's awesome. It's no, true. There isn't really a really accessible book on the koshas. I mean, there's, I know there's some work on yoga nidra, but mm -hmm. a lot of more medical or yoga therapy. Yep. Uh, and it feels like this is not really yoga therapy. You're trying to make it just accessible for everyone. Exactly. I mean, and I think probably there probably, hopefully, there'll be some yoga teachers and trainers who might find it useful. But I also wanted, yoga students you know maybe the first time someone came into class and sat down on a mat and said what are you talking about this is what i'm talking about so that they could take it home and read it and get some understanding of it from a contemporary framework but giving props to the tradition because that's where it came from and yeah. the way i described it in you know because you have to have an elevator sentence and an elevator paragraph and all that uh -huh. <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. I said, I, I, I want it to be down to earth and real so that, so that somebody who's familiar with the Western mind-body model of we have a mind, we have a body, they interact, and that's been accepted in Western um, medical world right now. But this Eastern model 
saying that you have five layers. You have a body, you have breath and energy, you have a mind with your emotions and your thoughts, you have your intuitive wisdom, your witness, and you have bliss. And if you, it just gives you, in my mind, a much deeper and broader foundation on which to figure out who am I really and how am I going to handle my life? Mm-hmm. And I think, I mean, for me, it's been a wonderful model that, that I can tap into whenever I get, you know, really frenetic. I say, okay, what's going on? Mm-hmm. What's going on in my body? All right. Low back, digestion is off. Okay. Why is that? What's happening to my energy? What am I thinking? What's the source of these thoughts? And then once I figure that out, I can, I can, I can either make a decision consciously to deal with it, or I can say, well, it is what it is, and I'm just going to wait till it's over, knowing that I also have to accept all the consequences that come with that. Or should I ever find myself in a situation that I cannot change no matter what I do, I change myself and find acceptance. So that's mm. kind of... The, the, it in a nutshell. That's beautiful. I love, I love the way you talked about it as a useful tool in your life because I don't think that, I don't think we talk about it that way very much. It seems like mm-hmm. I do hear the kosher model being used in yoga therapy a lot, that that's where they frame the, the therapist in a way frames the um, kind of the treatment plan that they create mm-hmm. for a client based on the kosher model. They might look at these different layers of what is that, what is that, what is that, what is that? Oh, exactly. And, and w- an interesting thing is that one of the, the intake forms that Joseph used in his yoga therapy training was based on the koshas. And what we began to notice is that when you ask people about their body, they had no problem. They could fill out, you know, they were what their stress level was, where their aches and their pains were. They could fill out most of, yeah, I feel like my breath's in my chest and, I'm, you know, sometimes I'm short of breath. Then when I got to, to, to energy, not so much. And then we got to mind, a little bit less. And so they, it, was, it was body heavy. And we real, I realized anyway that they don't get this. So hopefully I wanted to sort of offer something that might help them get it. So when they enter a yoga therapy class or a session, they'll have a sort of like an idea ahead of time of what it is they're going to be going through and understand when the therapist or the yoga teacher says, well, now we're going to focus on this on the body or the breath or the mind or the witness, or at the end of class, give you an experience of bliss and Shavasana. Mm. They would be able to tie all of that together. That's great. That's great. Uh, now I'm hearing a bit of an echo. I don't know if you could turn your volume down a little bit, maybe yeah. from my voice. Okay, is that better? Yeah. Um, okay. I like something you said also when you're describing um, the Vijnana Maya Kosha, and I don't, you know, everyone pronounced yeah. that differently. Yeah, that's right, Vijnana Maya Kosha. That you talked about the intuitive wisdom, and I love that word. I like intuition because I think intuition is actually that's the word that I use when I talk about it because I feel like that's mm-hmm. the word that we use in, in common conversation that mm-hmm. people can easily relate to, um, you know, cause I'm always also looking for ways to make these teachings accessible. And mm-hmm. I feel like intuition is just the, the right word for, for understanding that layer of being because this idea of wisdom body, like it just doesn't really feel available to me, mm-hmm. but I, well, <laughs> I can relate to the idea of intuition. Like I get that, I get yeah. this idea that, oh yeah, I have intuitive, thoughts and feelings that come mm-hmm. up during my day. Um, mm-hmm. So that made more sense. Yeah, and the other, I, I needed a visual in my head. So I don't know how tra- people who are really steeped in tradition would think about this, but it has really helped me. I think of a Venn diagram, you know, two circles that overlap for a portion. And the example I used um, was that, let's say you walk around feeling uh, low self-esteem, I'm not enough. In your mind, you could have gotten those messages from, you, feel, you, you really feel that it's true and you don't really think about where it came from, but you might be expressing it in, through addiction, through self-sabotage, mm-hmm. et cetera. So that's the mind part of the circle. Yeah. Then if you go to the wisdom part of the circle, the wisdom part of the circle, the intuitive wisdom is looking at, at you thinking that you're not enough and saying, yeah, okay. Those messages came from outside. They came from family. They came from society. They, right. You put them into your, into your psyche, into your mind. But look at honey. I know that that's not true. So if you're able um, to tune into that 
place where the, the intuitive wisdom and the mind overlap in the Venn diagram, that's where you have the, oh, I am enough. And then you get it. So that's kind of how I see how it works together. That's beautiful. And how do you explain the Ananda Maya Kosha to people? Basically, I two ways. I, I have it in, in, in my head, two levels, um, because you can start with, um, and I got this from Joseph Campbell, you know, the, the, the um, I, I, yeah. I can't remember, he was a professor of mythology and right. so forth. And he yeah. says that the first thing you do or the, the first thing you do when you're thinking about bliss, you don't, don't go off all enlightenment and stuff. Think about where you, um, where you lose yourself. You know, is it in gardening? Is it a hobby? Mm -hmm. What happens when you're in Shavasana? Or maybe for you, it's, a, it's meditation, or maybe it's prayer or religion. It could be anything that, and I think Maya Angelou said, you don't measure your life in the number of breaths that you take, but the number of, of things that take your breath away. So when you have that experience, and I had an experience like that when I was 12, um, we were on vacation in Maine, and we were hiking up a mountain, Mount McGuntacook. And I had never hiked a mountain before. And when we got to the top, it was like, wow. And I wasn't there for, you know, it might've been just a second, but I was like, whoa. So that's what, it, for me, that's kind of where it starts. Um, and I think that, that people can make an effort to experience that by, you know, healthy living, practicing yoga, maybe meditating or praying or involving yourself in your hobby. You can control the amount of time that you choose to spend in an activity that might inch you towards bliss. Um, you can choose a technique because there are many, um, but ultimately the ultimate stage of bliss in, in my mind and the way I think about it is something you do not control. Mm -hmm. You can set the stage and if it happens, you'll know it when you come out of it. You don't know it when you're in it because if you think you're in it, then you're not in it kind of thing. <laughs> so I think of it as two levels and, and I think if for people whom this is like totally esoteric and mystical, so start with where you are. What yeah. brings you joy? Time in nature, something like that. So what brings that's you how joy? I think about it. That's a good one. What brings mm -hmm. you joy? Um, and what about the other layers? I mean, we kind of jumped, I jumped to this more, the most subtle ones, but maybe we could just spend a minute talking about, okay. um, well, going backwards, I guess. So what about pran uh, pranamaya kosha? How do you get people okay. to connect? Yeah, I, I sort of um, have fun with this because I think about theoretical physics and um, <clears throat> I think about Albert Einstein's quote about everything is energy. And I think about Neil deGrasse Tyson, and he wasn't the only one who said this, but that we are all vibrating pieces of stardust that eventually yeah. vibrate us into a human existence. So energy for me is the underlying principle of everything. So, and breath is how we bring energy into our body. And so when, and I, I tell this to my students, I say, so when we're practicing our pranayama exercises or our breathing exercises, it's really important that you understand how you are breathing and where you are feeling the breath in your body. Because, and, and, and you know this, that if we're able to get breath and into the deepest part of the lungs that nourishes our organs, it nourishes our brain, it just nourishes everything, plus it helps spread the energy. So their breath and energy are, are interchangeable. So energy is kind of like the, the stardust version ah. and breath is the concrete physical version that okay. we can experience, but they're all linked together and breath can be the way we kind of tap into the energy. So. That's kind of how I work on explaining. That's beautiful. That. That's really beautiful. I mean, I, and I skip over mind and we talk maybe about the physical body, but I think you, you t to me, you touched on the ones that I think are harder to explain and describe. Yeah. And I, mm -hmm. it seemed like that's where your book, that's where your book is about, really trying to get people access to those more subtle ideas in a simple right. way. Yeah, and, and so what I did in the book was I, I have an, each, each layer has an, overview where I kind of try to explain what it is in basic English language using um, a little bit of research here and there when I could find something that was appropriate. And yeah. then what follows um, 
I considered them essays, but the editor says, um, these are chapters. I said, okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> so they're, they're chapters, but they're, they're stories. They're, because when I read a self-help or personal growth book, what I'm looking for, especially if the author has a lot of good credentials, don't just tell me what's in your head. You've got to tell me how you use this information in your own life. Mm -hmm. And it's fine if you bring in other examples of friends and colleagues or clients and students, but if you can't relate <clears throat> your information to your life, how, how do I know that it worked for you? If it didn't work for you, how would I even figure out that it would work for me? So the, the chapters kind of describe how, um, how I came to realize, work with, and understand each of the layers I discuss. And then at the end of the chapters are um, suggested exercises because I'm, I'm, as I said before, I'm not a person who says you do it this way and you will yeah. get this result. You know, here's a bunch of things, yeah. see if something works, you know, throw it up against the wall and see if something sticks. Mm -hmm. And if it sticks and it works for you, fine. This is what worked for me, but I don't know whether it's gonna work for you. Yeah. Well, I love what you just said. Sense. I love that idea of, uh, that as the writer needs to give personal examples and share their, just because I'm working on my second book right now, it's mm -hmm. definitely more personal and it's hard. You know, sometimes it's hard as a writer, you, you, you want to sound professional, but also mm -hmm. if you don't expose yourself and share, then to me, it just, right. it falls flat. Not just like you had a great reason, which is it doesn't maybe have as much meaning, but also it doesn't, it's not as engaging. I think as a reader, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's more academic if it's just yes. that, you know, and I think if you can't give examples or stories right. of your experience. So I'm, I'm always trying to find that level, like, where's that level? Yeah. The amount, the right, yeah, the balance, right amount of sharing, um, mm -hmm. you know? And you think about, you think about the, the, your most favorite books, <clears throat> the ones that are on your bedside table, you know, or yeah. where you keep where you keep those, that small collection of books that you go back to over and over again. And then you ask yourself, well, what draws you to these books? And I look at the books that are on, on my shelves and pre, other than the, the technical yoga books, you know, the sutras and the yeah. Bhagavad Gita and Rumi and all of those things, the, the, the books that mean the most to me are the ones where I could get, I could put myself in the author's head mm -hmm. and I could understand where he or she was coming from and I could understand their message and I could pick and choose what could work for me. So, yeah. And, and the writing and, process itself is like, yeah. that's like really fun. I mean, how did you know when you, how did you know you were a writer or when did you know you were a writer? I don't know if I am. <laughs> <laughs> of course you are. But I'm you a teacher. A book. I'm a teacher. So that's where mm -hmm. I start. You know, I've been a yoga teacher for, a long time well I think probably almost as long as you but like nope. 25 years I've been teaching and it just felt like writing just started coming out of that you know I just started writing because I wanted to teach more so I was like teaching mm -hmm. in person and I was writing mm -hmm. and it just it's just another format for teaching for me yeah um, mm -hmm. so that's that's where it came out of I don't have any training in writing at all so uh, I don't I either I, I started really? writing when I was yeah. yeah, I said, no, mm -mm. I started writing when I was 12 years old. I wrote a poem that I took into my English class and in elementary school and got laughed at, but that was okay. So, and, and then I, when, um, when I really started thinking about the, the children's book, Ogie Bogey, I went back and I have all, I realized I have boxes of stuff that I have written over the years and never done anything mm -hmm. with. And I pulled them out and I looked at them and I said, oh yeah, I have an unpublished novel. I got two books of short stories. I've got all of this stuff. And so now when the, when the pandemic hit and everybody was on lockdown and my classes were canceled TFN till further notice, I just pulled all that stuff out and boom, 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 boom. And then I found my, I found a writer's group that I really, really like. We meet twice a month for three wow. hours wow. and we share, we have prompts and that just was just keep let, lighting the fire under my behind to keep me going. So yeah, writing right now is just as wonderful and joyful to me as yoga. Yeah. So that's yeah, beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like it too, but it's also um, writing to me also 
is challenging. It's almost like sometimes it's like um, self analysis. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like if, if you really mm -hmm. put yourself out there, you really have to think mm -hmm. clearly. What do I really think about that? How do I feel? Mm -hmm. and how does that relate? So you're, to me? you're journeying through your coaches right there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what writing yeah. does for me. I mean, it does. You know, it really makes me examine myself. Otherwise, yeah, it's like it just feels academic and I don't want to read mm -hmm. that either. So I try to, when I write, I try to think of something that's going to be useful that I would want to read. Like, just like you mm -hmm. said, I thought it was a beautiful example about the books on your, that special collection of books you have. What is it that I, you know, what, what draws me to certain kinds of writing? And I think it's that mm -hmm. the voice that's, that's honest, maybe the honest, honesty, yeah. I think. Um, yes, and authentic, absolutely. Yeah, the authentic, yeah, the authentic voice. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, let's see, anything else about your book that you wanted to share with us? Um, well, let's see. The, um, I'm in the middle of working with a, uh, the publisher. It's a hybrid publisher um, because I'd self as I I'd self published the uh, Ogie Bogie book, and that was it's good, but it was a lot of work. And now I want to really focus more on writing more. So I decided to go to the with with the hybrid model, which right. is it. The hybrid model is interesting to me because um, it allows you to have creative control over the final product. And if you go with a traditional publisher, um, you might write this wonderful book, soulful book on yoga, and they will take it, pay you a very teeny, teeny, tiny <laughs> advance, and then you lose all, they will edit it whatever they want, and you have no say. And I just could not do that. Well, it depends. So, it depends. That's, it that depends, depends on the on publisher. The contract. Yeah, and on the yeah. publisher. And I, I, I definitely, my editor might be watching this, so I have to be careful what I say, but... Um, <laughs> You know, they do generally control the title and cover, mm -hmm. but the contents often is up to the author. At least that's what I found that they, they, they're involved, but very much want it to be my voice. That's been my experience with my publisher. Okay. So I, I'm not, I haven't had, I've, maybe that's other people, other publishers, but. Yo, you've got a good publisher and, and, okay. and you're publishing with a, a firm that is closely tied into what you do and understanding yeah. that field, which is probably, yeah. probably why. So yeah, yeah. Shambhala, I can say Shambhala Publishers. Yes. They're, they're good. I really appreciate them and I appreciate their support. Um, and I yeah, find so, the little, I was going to say the, the hybrid, my hybrid publisher, the, yeah. she's the editor she's never really stepped foot on a yoga mat so it's interesting to me uh, because she asks me questions that I might make an assumption that anybody who would read this sentence or this yeah. paragraph would understand it even though it's yeah. in basic English even though it might be um, talking about um, a, a yoga an aspect of yoga and she's like uh and I'm like oh okay so that yeah it's good. good practice yeah, I, I know. I, I kind of like the editing process, although it's kind of exhausting, but you just go over it over and over and over and over. It's, I get tired of reading my own book, you know, it's like I know, I the, know. End Of <laughs> the end of it, you've read it three, four times straight through and it's just like, oh, exactly. Like, You're done. You're done. done. It's like, I, I burst um, it. Let it grow. I'm yeah. done. <laughs> but you go. can't. <laughs> Uh, the other, I know there's something else you want to talk about. You kind of want to talk about the future of yoga. Like that was the theme. Oh, that yes. Right yeah. Um, I and this is a, um, something that um, it took me a long time to get to. And probably most, like most people, I came into yoga for the physical activity, for the asana, um, because it made me feel good. Um, and then I found a class, it was the only class, and I, none of those early classes that I took did much at the end of the class for Shavasana. So I wasn't even aware that that was a thing. And then um, I was working full time, second marriage, stepson, mm. my own kid, lots of stuff. And I was looking for a yoga class. And the only one that fit the schedule that I could manage was a Kundalini class. And I thought, mm. I don't know what that is, but I'll give it a shot. It was interesting. Um, but the last 15 minutes of every class was spent in Shavasana. And the, after the first time I got up, I said, what was that? That yeah. was amazing. The teacher explained it to me and I said, oh, okay. So that began my journey to figure out what else is this about? And by the time I, by the time her class was over, the series of classes that I had been taking, 
I had an incident in the parking lot that really set me off on understanding yoga on a deeper level because I have this thing about being on time and mm and uh, making sure that my car will get me to wherever I need to go. And so if there's something wrong with my car, I freak out. I go to it's a total stress panic. So uh -huh. I came out of class that night and I went to dig in my pocketbook for my keys and they weren't there. And uh -huh. guess where they were? They were in the ignition. Uh -huh. And I turned around, I went back downstairs, found a couple of the students that were still there, told them what happened. They called the police. The police came with a little jiggy thingy and opened the window. I got in the car, started it up, and I was driving out of the parking lot and I hit the brake and I said, oh, I didn't panic. Ah. Oh, oh my God, there must be more to this yoga stuff than even I could possibly <laughs> consider right now. So that was it. And so by the time I found but at the time I found Joseph's class and he was, yeah. he was coaches from day one um, yeah. and, the, and, and really talking about yoga. The one thing that yoga can do for almost anybody who takes a class is help them deal with stress management. Mm. And so, yes, asana is important, but it is one small part. I mean, if there are eight limbs of yoga and asana is one limb, well, what about the rest of those limbs and how are they going to fit and how are we going to express them in our classes and our writing and our speaking in our communities and get that message out mm. so we avoid the total commercialization of you know yoga spandex friendly bodies and calendars and all the, and oh this is the other thing that really freaked mm -hmm. me out i saw it was a cover of one of those, it was either Time or Newsweek. And there was an article in it that was titled Yoga for Migraine Headaches. So mm -hmm. I said, oh, that's interesting. So I turned to the article. The article was good, but you know what the picture was? The picture was of a man balancing on his big toe with his other leg behind oh, his God. head. Oh. I know, right? And I'm thinking, if I have a migraine headache, <laughs> would I go to a yoga class after seeing this? Nuh-uh. <laughs> No. So yeah, making You're yoga, exactly. And, and most of the students I work with, um, and I have one class that basically I've still been teaching since 1995. And up until the pandemic, I had one woman in her mid eighties who'd been in the class since 1995, wow. but they're not quote unquote yogis. They're coming because they need to relax. They need specific techniques for stress reduction. They're not interested in learning how to do headstands or handstands. They want to know what to do um, if, if something happens, a stressful event happens, and they need to calm down within two to five minutes. Is there something they can do? How can they, they use these practices in their life on a daily basis? So that's kind of, yeah. I see it's getting yeah, dark know. there. It's funny. I'm, I'm watching well, you, you to... fading away. <laughs> I know, yeah. I know. Do, should we have to go turn on a light? Well, I think, I mean, we should probably wrap it up, actually. I think it's kind okay. of beautiful. It feels very yoga. Oh, all like, right. It's like we're going inwards. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> yeah, the sun has gone down, That's and awesome. I, I usually don't turn the lights on in the back, but yeah. Yeah, no. I mean, but I, I appreciate what you're saying. I mean, of course, that's like my passion, you know, just mm -hmm. trying to change that, mis that not, not just misunderstanding, but this false idea that keeps people away from yoga. It's, it's, it's right. so much harm has been done. And, you know, I, I love that you're, you're doing that with your book in such a beautiful way. I mean, especially these subtle practices. I think those are the mm -hmm. ones that are most easily lost and misunderstood. Yes. Um, exactly. So thank you. I'm so excited to finish it. I, I have started it and I'm going to finish it. And okay. how, maybe can we put a link on, um, can people order yet? Can people order? Um, not, yet, not yet, but okay. what, I, what I'm going to do as soon as I, we get to that point, because we're still in the pre-production, but as soon as I have a link, it'll be up on my website. I'll be posting it all over and I'll, I'll put it in the accessible yoga okay. group and so forth. All right. And maybe I can put your website on here. Um, as oh, a, sure. It's just bethgibbs.com. Yeah. So I'll add it once we're done. Yeah. Okay, right. cool. Awesome. Yep. So thank you all so right. much for your thank time you. and for all your teaching and for sharing with us. And we're excited for your book. Thanks yeah. for being here. Yeah. And thank you for your work. I oh, really love it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Take all care. right. Bye. All right. Bye. Bye.